Hi, I'm Marissa Vickery, and I'm pleased to have you join us with Drone Programming in the Classroom. Thank you for your time today, and I'm so excited to share with you the presenters that we have. Along with myself, we will be hearing from Dennis Baldwin, who is the founder of Drone Blocks, also Roger Palmer with GIS, etc., and Bill Swope with Half and Associates. So each of them will have a chance to tell you a little bit more about themselves. And I'm going to go ahead and start because something that was really important to us during this presentation is for teachers or students from any age or uh, ability to be able to learn a way to program a drone. So I'm going to begin with the most simple, basic way, and that's with drag and drop programming with drone blocks. So I'm going to share my screen with you. There we are. Uh, we created Drone Blocks about six years ago, really to fill a gap. Uh, STEM and STEAM were fairly new, and, and too much of school, in my opinion, was becoming based around testing, and our students needed more. Uh, Dennis Baldwin approached me when he was a parent at the school I was working at and, and had the idea to create something to spark learning in our community. And that was it. Uh, over the years, we then created curriculum courses around an app that Dennis created. And it not only engages students with drones, but, but teaches them programming in, in a variety of ways. Um, and it infuses math, science, engineering, um, the arts, writing, and, and research into differentiated lessons. So I want to briefly show you the most basic of drone programming. And, and what you can do to share with your youngest or most beginning students. Then Dennis will present how learning can be scaffolded into exploring the more advanced programming and facets of flying drones autonomously. With drone blocks, DJI drones are used with our curriculum primarily because of the access to the SDK software. They're also, in my opinion, some of the easiest drones to learn to fly. Part of the reason that we wanted to offer curriculum around drones is, is to give educators the chance to share this with their students, even if they don't have the expertise. I, I've never flown a drone. I've never flown anything even with a remote control. So we really sought to create curriculum and lessons that walk you through it, even if you do not have the expertise or the experience with that. So I'm all that sure that all of you were as expired as I was listening to the speakers in the general session this morning. And as you all heard mentioned many times, it is crucial for us as educators to enforce drones for good and the importance of preserving our right to fly. Please use the resources that are available to us to promote this and, and teach our students how to work towards jobs within the many, many areas of drones and drone technology. At DroneBlocks, we offer a variety of curriculum, a simulator, and two apps, DroneBlocks and DroneBlocks Code. We use Google's Blockly to enable drag and drop programming to program your drone to fly autonomously. No need to worry about trusting students to manually fly outside or indoors through the classroom. The missions can be pre-programmed. They can be checked by, by um, so another student or the teacher for efficiency, and then flown by launching the student's code. Using these simplest blocks of code, you can design a mission as sim simple as this first one, taking off, fly up 20 inches, fly forward 20 inches, yaw or turn right, and land. Then you can enhance that learning and, and build upon those basics. So take it a step further and challenge your students to program the drone to fly in the shape of a square. Have them collaborate to check their angles, distances, and then test. And then next, on the final square, you can introduce loops and how important they are in coding and how they can be used to simplify and refine the code. These are just simple examples of 
of something that can provide not only an excellent introduction to computer science, but really a way to integrate drones and programming across the curriculum. As your students progress and master drag and drop coding, they can also learn to incorporate variables, logic, advanced formulas to create really intricate and, and challenging missions such as, as the one on this slide. Even though this type of programming seems simple and elementary, as you can see here, the, the possibilities of integrating just math alone are, are pretty incredible. Something I wanted to share before turning over to Dennis is our teleflight simulator. Dennis worked really hard to, to put something in place for students to learn to program, um, especially those that don't have immediate access to a drone or maybe live near a no-fly zone where they just cannot fly at all. Uh, when COVID hit, this really became a priceless tool for teachers teaching distantly and, and even parents just needing something for their students to do or their children to do at home. Uh, the simulator provides the opportunity for students to really create missions and solve challenges and then be able to see them on the screen. So it shows the path of the mission and, and students have the ability to then problem solve their code again, even if they don't even have access to a drone. For me, the component of a, of a simulator really brings an artistic uh, portion to drones and programming because the, pl the flight path becomes a visual design and, and often truly a work of art. This mission here in the photo was shared by a colleague of ours, Luigi Torelli um, from Italy. And he presented the challenge of flying curves, which is pretty phenomenal in itself. And then using those curves to create the shape of an umbrella. So this is beautiful and, and just absolutely brilliant. So I appreciate you listening. And now I'm going to go ahead and share the time with Dennis Baldwin. Um, and here we go. Well, in iOS and the Google Play stores, um, our code is on GitHub. We'll get to GitHub in a little bit, but we want to make this as accessible to as, as many people as possible. And uh, I'll start off with just what I call the oversimplified ecosystem of uh, drone hardware and software and apps. So if we think about uh, mobile, mo mobile computing, how quickly that has evolved over the years to where we were concerned about hardware and sensors. And then we, you know, Steve Jobs early in 2000 gave access to developers uh, to, the, to the actual hardware through software. And that led to uh, interesting apps. So think of your interaction with your mobile phone on a daily basis. Uh, it's all about the apps. And so what we're seeing uh, the evolution of hardware in the drone space, you have your airframe, your rotors, your, your hardware equipment, and then you have software that interfaces with that. And that ultimately leads to uh, interesting apps, apps that I'm sure uh, Bill and Roger will talk about at some point um, in their presentations. But Drone Deploy is an example, Pix4D, the DJI Go app, which uh, comes with all the DJI drones and drone blocks, uh, even makes use of the uh, DJI SDK. So we'll start off talking about indoor uh, coding in flight. So uh, Vitello, as Marissa mentioned, is a really affordable drone. It runs about $99 uh, with, with no uh, additional accessories. You can get it for about 100 bucks and fly it indoors with um, amazing sensing capabilities. We call this a GPS de denied environment where Tello can hold position accurately and we can send commands to it to uh, fly Tello around the room. So Marissa covered a little bit of the drag and drop programming. We also have drone blocks code, which as students evolve beyond block based programming, uh, we feel that JavaScript is a very uh, friendly language. Um, it's a language that once you learn, you can bring to uh, your knowledge to other a software platform. So Dronebox code is available for Windows. We have an iOS beta, so if anyone is interested, please feel free to reach out and uh, we can give you access to that. So learning JavaScript we feel is important because if you've interacted with any web application, there's likely been JavaScript 
as part of that application. We feel that going beyond the browser and learning how to program Tello, teaching fundamental concepts of, of variables, uh, functions, different uh, control flow logic allows you to take that programming to other drones, to other programming languages, and to other industries. One thing that's very interesting to me was uh, we got wind several years ago of the Node-RED project. This is uh, out of IBM. And Node-RED was a, originally designed to uh, wire hardware devices together. So you may have heard the term IoT, the Internet of Things, but you can think about Maybe your Amazon Alexa, maybe your fridge is connected, who knows, but uh, Node-RED allows us to use a flow-based programming language or environment to wire together logic, and ultimately uh, we were able to do that with Tello. So um, the, the nodes that you can see on this interface, you can drag and drop and then build custom logic for every node and ultimately be able to uh, interface with drone hardware. So I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation a little bit about GitHub. Uh, if you look at this logo on the left, this is a, a cute iconic figure from uh, the GitHub. Uh, it's, it's their logo, but ultimately they got acquired by Microsoft a few years ago. And if you were able to attend the um, opening presentations this morning, you may have seen one from Zipline. They were one that's very inspiring to me. I had not heard of them before. And so I ended up on GitHub. I searched for Zipline. And let me just show you, hopefully this will come through. Uh, there's a Zipline project on GitHub that has sensor information uh, from their aircraft from, I believe, five seconds before takeoff to 15 seconds after. And what they're requesting the community to do is take some of the sensor information process it, do something interesting, and see if you can detect anomalies. So the beauty of GitHub is that a lot of people, uh, DroneBlocks definitely included, we, we believe in open source, sharing our code, uh, making it available for others to see. So here you can see uh, one of the Zipline aircraft. If you got to see this in person or on video this morning, it was truly amazing. If not, I encourage you to uh, definitely watch one of the recordings. So as part of what we do is we want to introduce programming languages that are common in the workplace, common in the field. And this one uh, is known as Python. Python, if you heard Matt Holvey from Bell say he doesn't hire an engineer that doesn't have some fundamental level of a Python understanding. So we have written a course and curriculum as well as made code open source that demonstrates how to interface with Tello using Python. This is something that I'm super excited to talk about. Uh, one of our colleagues, Pat Ryan, has been working on some code and a course for us to uh, use Tello for uh, indoor positioning and, and Aruco markers. And so that is done with a uh, open source technology known as OpenCV, Open Computer Vision. And in OpenCV, we have access to all sorts of, of vision algorithms. And a uh, good example here of something that Pat Ryan put together is known as the uh, Python point and click control. If you have any familiarity with the DJI hardware, uh, they have a feature built into Go called tap fly. And what, the way that works is you hold up your screen, you sort of tap on the image, the drone will reposition itself um, and center on the, the tap location. Well, Pat Ryan was able to use um, OpenCV, getting the televideo feed to allow users to be able to click on an image and reposition Tello. And for the educators out there, definitely the math educators, I had always wondered um, prior to doing, getting involved with drone blocks, where would I use Pythagorean theorem? But this is a real world example of where that happens. So uh, this orange block is some Python code that came from Pat Ryan's repo. It basically demonstrates how you calculate the distance between the center point and the point click. So in this demonstration, if I click, Tello will then, or I should say Python will make the calculation of the distance, send commands to Tello, and Tello will reposition itself. And once again, this source code is currently available at Git, on GitHub. And as a side note, I will uh, put a link to all of these resources in, in the uh, chat box when I'm done with this presentation. 
Okay, another really cool application are known as fiducial markers. In this case, these are Aruco markers, but there's other ones known as April tags. And what those allow us to do is in robotic applications, when you're indoors and you don't have access to GPS, you can use these markers uh, to determine the position and the pose as it relates to the marker. So I know that sounds maybe a bit technical, but think of looking at uh, a painting on the wall or a picture where it's off in the distance. Your brain, your mind can quickly tell you roughly the, the distance you are away from it, your position as it relates to uh, that painting, the orientation. And so what we can do with OpenCV and these markers is determine our position and use those markers throughout a warehouse, let's say, uh, to be able to re reposition ourselves to know where we are so that we can uh, apply the next command, fly to a different location and, and always keep a relative location of where we are. So I talked a little bit about Tello. We, we feel strongly about that just because of the entry point, the capabilities, being able to access open source software to interface with it. But in addition to that, as Mar Marissa mentioned, uh, DroneBlocks supports DJI drones. There's many third-party applications um, that use DJR, DJI hardware, and that allows for uh, applications such as mapping, uh, infrastructure inspection, anywhere outdoors where we might need to know the position of the drone to be able to take photos and process that imagery, uh, we can do with GPS-based uh, hardware. So you may be familiar with the term of an SDK. Uh, in this case, DJI released an SDK known as a software development kit to allow developers to interface with their aerial platform. For example, uh, with drone blocks, we can take a photo or we can fly to a location. That's all done uh, using this DJI SDK, which is available for iOS, Android, and Windows. And if you're in the world of teaching computer software, once again, I, I mentioned earlier about JavaScript and understanding, you know, fundamental concepts such as variables, functions, uh, control flow. If you have that knowledge or your students have that knowledge, they can learn. Uh, I wouldn't say Objective-C, I would say Swift, uh, Java, and C Sharp uh, for Windows-based uh, or desktop-based applications. So the cool thing about um, DJI hardware and DJ, the DJI SDK is there's this old adage from Sun Microsystems back in the day that was like, write once, run anywhere. That was very, uh, very related to the Java programming language. You could write code and have it run on pretty much any, any hardware. And so that's what DJI has aimed to do with their SDK. So an application like DroneBlocks, Pix4D, there's Maps Made Easy, there's uh, probably a, a couple hundred of them now. Those that use the DJI SDK are able to tap into uh, the capabilities of the hardware. So this is an example I just wanted to share of something that you can do uh, with the SDK. And I encourage you, there's a, a demo link uh, on YouTube as well as the source code I made available. But when Mavic Mini was released, we got a lot of requests uh, to interface with the Mavic Mini. If you've not seen that drone, it's, it's tiny. It weighs less than 250 grams. Uh, it's got GPS based, uh, a GPS uh, module in it, flight controller logic, the SDK works with it. And so I thought with iOS, the latest version of iOS and the game controller um, framework, we're able to pair the Xbox remote with the iPhone and then send commands to the DJI control, uh, flight controller. So essentially what we're doing is we're sending a flight control logic from the Xbox remote directly over the air to, uh, to the DJI Mavic Mini. So that's just an example of what can be done using the SDK. And you know, I guess really the sky's the limit as you think about third party applications, uh, teaching students to understand uh, software concepts so that one day they'll be able to apply this knowledge uh, for a, their small business or, or for a, a larger corporation. So we talked about Tello flight indoors. We talked a little bit about DJI, uh, GPS-based drones, and now I wanna just cover briefly uh, DIY drones. Uh, this photo is a uh, 
DIY build of the, the Bell Vertical Robotics Challenge drone uh, for next year. And so we've been working with them on really just um, helping test uh, writing code and, and uh, manuals to, to support their initiative. And so if you really want the most flexibility, uh, you're gonna look at a DIY uh, cap capability. I don't know if anyone here was able to attend the hardware session with Ron Pointer. Uh, we, we work with OnPoint uh, Drone Solutions and they do a lot uh, in the world of, of these drone kits. So that DIY drone, while it is the most flexible, it does require the most amount of knowledge to, to build, to operate, to configure all of that. And so from that, you get many benefits. Uh, custom sensors, for example, that, that's my poor attempt to, at a sensor. That's a temperature sensor. That's, that's probably the lamest sensor example, but I'll give you, a, I think, a good one. Um, a methane gas sensor, perhaps you want to fly over a landfill and capture, you know, the CO2 output or any sort of uh, telemetry sensor data that you can gather. Uh, you're not going to be able to do that easily with, let's say, a DJI Phantom. Of course, you could mount one on there, but a custom uh, build would allow you to not only put the sensor on there, you're, it's going to be designed to carry this custom payload, right? So a lot of the DJI drones are sort of designed for flight with the uh, configuration that they currently come off the shelf with. If you want custom payloads, you're going to look at larger motors, you know, larger uh, propellers, larger batteries, and then that allows you to write custom software. So in the methane gas example, you could essentially build a drone, program it to get that sensor information, uh, send that sensor information real time back to a ground station, and, and plot it and, and make actionable uh, decisions while it's in the air or land, get that information and then uh, process it after the fact. So the DIY drone community is, is definitely something I feel strongly about. It's, it's, it's something that I got involved with way before uh, DJI came along. So um, I, I, I definitely want to share and encourage that you take a look at some of these projects. So we have the PX4 firmware, uh, which runs on the flight controller. There's another popular one known as APM. Uh, we have ground, Q ground control, which is a ground station that lets us get telemetry, uh, sends information, and is a Python-based um, programming interface that allows us to write custom code and uh, control the autopilot. And I, I would like to mention that this, once again, is an open, uh, oversimplified view of, of that uh, DIY stack. So I know that was a lot to cover. I wanted to make sure that I gave time to uh, Roger and Bill to, to go over their stuff. But if you guys have any questions, you can reach me at db at droneblocks.io. Uh, connect with us on social media. And I look forward to uh, connecting with you guys in the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dennis. Much appreciated. Um, and now I'd like to introduce you all to Roger Palmer. Roger? And Roger, if you would unmute your, your mic, please. Thank you, sir. Roger, I'm still not hearing you. I'm hoping that's not on my end. But that, can you hear me now? Oh, there you are, there you are. Thank you, sir. Okay, it was something with my microphone probably. Okay. Um, let me turn up the volume so I can hear your feedback. But I was gonna say if Bill wants to go first, only because he's gonna explain some things with Pix4D, and then I'll show some, some projects that we've done with Pix4D. Is that, uh, Bill, does that throw you off or? No, no, that's fine. I can go first if you want. Okay. Thank you. There we go. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen then. And let me know when you all can see that. Yes, sir. All right, go ahead and get started. Well, th well thanks very much for having me here today. And I wanted to thank uh, uh, Ken Berry who, uh, who asked me to talk today. I think a little bit, because um, I'm not quite the, the software person <laughs> that, uh, that Dennis was for sure, and probably not that, that Roger is, but uh, 
uh, kind of more of the end user and kind of what we're using as far as operating our drones and, and, and getting into mapping uh, with PIX4D. So just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a certified photogrammetrist and work for our half associates. Um, I'm based in our uh, Richardson, Texas office. And I've just been with the firm for about a year and a half now. Um, I'm uh, also the assistant director with the American Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, the professional practice division, which is our standards and certification uh, area. Uh, I'm a rep, um, a Texas state rep. There's two of us for ASPRS for their Mid-South region. It's a region-based society. Um, I'm also TxDOT pre-certified in aerial mapping. Uh, and then a, a couple of other items about myself. They're a member of uh, North Central Texas COGS, North Texas Unmanned Aircraft Systems Safety and Integration Task Force, which is kind of how I've gotten involved with working with UAS and education. Um, so glad to be a part of all this. Um, so a little, just a little bit about half briefly here. So we're a, a multidisciplinary a professional services firm. Um, we we kind of consider ourselves a one-stop shop a professional services firm. So we cover everything from architecture to civil engineering uh, to surveying, um, also in getting into the environmental sciences and GIS, um, visual, visualization, et cetera. Um, and so I'm part of the, the survey practice and, and there because of my geospatial background, being a photogrammetrist. Um, Half uh, was started in 1950 by Dr. Albert Half, Texas-based employee-owned company and we are now in uh, five states and have 24 different offices. One of the keys there I want to highlight is we've been doing surveying since 1957, um, and the geospatial services um, division within our uh, survey practice just started in 2018. So for professional services, a lot of this is, is relatively new. Um, so what are we doing at HALF? Um, we're doing, uh, uh, of course, photogrammetry. And now I break that down into kind of four different distinctions there. So we're using drones or the, the small and manned aerial systems uh, with structure from motion, um, but also LIDAR. Um, we've got an M600 that we use for that. And then also manned aircraft. So working with uh, airplanes and helicopters still at this point. And again, both with uh, a digital camera system there and LIDAR. Um, we're heavily into mobile LIDAR because all of our aerial missions with TxDOT are supplemented with mobile LIDAR now. And in fact, I'll touch upon this when I'm talking a little bit about more of the software. All of these uh, um, different data collection methods, the, the data sets are, are now uh, more and more just being merged together and used uh, for, to get a more complete picture of the project. So we're into terrestrial LIDAR uh, and we're getting uh, into quite a bit into bathymetry, more than I ever knew about um, getting the, the uh, information on a surface for underwater. Um, so we just look at ourselves as being survey, surveyors with specialized tools to go out and, and help us be more efficient in the data collection method that we use. Um, so today specifically to talk about photogrammetry, LIDAR, and, uh, and our applications or how we're using PIX4D. Um, so PIX4D, um, just real briefly here, it's, uh, we're using the drone mapping or um, uh, PIX4D mapper. Um, which is uh, the, the application that we're using the most. So that's their, their drone mapping and photogrammetry software. Um, and what it does is it use, uses both photogrammetry and other specialized algorithms to help it create 3D maps and 3D modeling um, in a real high level sense. Um, so PIX4D employs structure from motion rather than aero triangulation. Um, as a photogrammetrist, I'm accustomed to working with aero triangulation, which is essentially taking information or photo identification points that can be seen in multiple images uh, and multiple uh, points in, in several images or all of the images together. Whereas structure for motion is taking that point cloud data that's already there of the entire area uh, um, and using that to, to orientate itself or to calibrate itself is kind of the, the, the easiest way to, to describe the difference between those two. Um, so with drones, there's a, a lot more uh, overlap and side lap than when you're using manned aircraft. Um, most manned aircraft missions are going to be 3060 on the overlap and side lap, whereas with drones, um, you know, sometimes we're doing 90-90, um, depending on what we're trying to capture. Um, so as I said, 
We're using mainly uh, PIX4D Mapper. We do have PIX4D Capture, which is for flight planning and control, essentially. Um, we use a couple different software applications I have mentioned there towards the bottom for that as well. Um, so PIX4D is good with, with uh, uh, all different camera types or sensor types, so RGB, thermal, multispectral uh, imagery. Um, of course, we're always utilizing uh, surveyed ground control and checkpoints um, uh, within the mapping because for us, we're trying to hit certain um, accuracy and tolerance levels. Um, and so it's very important for us that we have uh, that survey data, that XYZ data, um, not the 2D data, but for us the 3D data to incorporate into the mapping to give us the best product that we can give to our clients, the, the product that has the highest degree of, of accuracy with it. So some of the other the software that we're using to run the drones is Reality Capture, is really starting to make a name for themselves, Agisoft and Drone Deploy. Um, just recently here, um, Esri's getting into this a little bit more as ArcGIS came out uh, with their site scan, which is a, a, a 3DR partnership that they have going on. And there's many others. And another thing that I'll mention too, that we're starting to see a little bit because we work with uh, any number of public agencies. And that's the fact that some of them um, are starting to get a little uh, pushback on working with DGI uh, products. Um, we currently work with all DGI products and I think most professional services firms do. But uh, some of the folks here, um, even at the uh, kind of regional or county level, um, are starting to move away from that just because of issues that are political and go beyond what I'm going to talk about here today. So I wanted to go in just real quickly here because I know I only just have a few minutes here and I want to give Roger plenty of time. Just a, a, a real quick workflow with, with PIX4D. And this is really one of the reasons why PIX4D is as widely used as it is. And it probably is the most widely used software when it comes to photogrammetry uh, software for drones um, in professional services. Um, and it's because of it, it's simple, right? So there's not a lot to this. So uh, the, the first image to the left there is just the project creation where you're naming things, telling it where you're going to uh, uh, keep the project. Uh, and the next step essentially is, is adding the images um, to the project. Um, and in our case, our images are always going to be geo-referenced because again out there we're using data that has to be tied into survey control data. So this is part of PIX4D and that's real important to us as is being able to select uh, the coordinate system that we're working in because we're not always working in the same area, uh, right? We're, we're, we're working in at right now in five different states. Uh, so that's real important for us. Um, and then what it, essentially what's going to get spit out to you for the folks that are working in-house is going to be this map view where you uh, have the layout of, of the project. Uh, just a real quick breakdown for some of the folks who aren't a, a real acquainted with this, but the green lines underneath are the flight lines. Uh, the red dots are the exposures or where the data was captured. Uh, the blue crosses there are where we've had uh, control um, uh, incorporated in this particular project. And again, one of the things that's nice about PIX4D, again, for us is the ability to be able to bring in that ground control, that XYZ, which is going to be um, used in every single project that we have right now. Um, we've got a pretty sophisticated mobile LiDAR system that we've been getting really good results with uh, running without control. Um, we're not quite there to the point that I would tell our clients that we're going to do it without control. And for us, why is that important? Because Control for our clients, what it does is it adds more time and money to the project. How is that? By just having to put down that control uh, and the amount of control that we have to put down. And that's people actually out there working on the ground in many cases to do that, unless we're able to use photo identification um, in lieu of the control. Uh, but you know, we'd like to have ground control down there and we'd like to have surveys, surveyors that have gone out and collected that data for us. I'm hoping that this video will, uh, will show up here um, for you all, because uh, this is, again, what we're ultimately trying to get to for our clients or what's so amazing about um, using drones for what we do, our mapping. Now, this is just uh, I'm an example uh, of the model from a, 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 an institution we did down in Southern Texas, at University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Um, this was a, a pretty big project for us. Most of the projects that we're using drones on right now are a little bit smaller uh, than what this one was. This one was pushing a thousand acres. 
Um, generally, I'm trying to keep things under 500 acres. If I go over 500, I usually look to using manned aircraft at this point because for us, it's still less expensive and there's less control to put down for a manned aircraft project than there is for drones for a project of that size. That's changing and I'm sure that will change rather quickly. Um, and I'm going to keep moving on here so that I get time for Roger, but you get an idea of, of not only the breadth of this data, what you're getting, um, but what you can do with this data. And we're just starting to, you know, make it clear to our clients what they can do with the data and how data fusion and data mining really fall into that. This is also another aspect of why drones are so useful for projects. This is for work for one of our oil and gas clients uh, doing some pipeline work. So this is stationing video. We can capture this video at the same time as we capture data uh, for mapping. But what this is important for this client, particular client is, is that they've got to go back and you can see the pipeline kind of in the top of the screen there, hopefully. They've got to go back uh, in a home like this where they're going to dig up some, some of these areas and have to put in new pipeline. And they're going to have to replace everything and make it look just like it was before, or they're going to have somebody that's talking to an attorney that's going to be talking to them. So they use this stationing video on almost all of their projects now when they're either uh, doing some work on old pipeline or putting in new pipelines so that they make sure that they can cover um, themselves with risk and liability. Uh, and again, we use PIX4D to bring in this data and we use PIX4D um, on the mapping side of things uh, for this to, to be able to spit out the, the information that they need for the projects that they do for design. A couple of the things that I just wanted to touch on here were the common uses that we have now with drones in professional services, using either photo photogrammetry or LIDAR, um, bringing that data into PIX4D or any number of the software applications that we have. In addition to the topo mapping, the planimetric mapping, again, that can be used then for the 3D modeling, which is used for flood plane, plane, plane analysis. We do a lot of volume calculations, whether it's for landfills or just for aggregate companies companies that are working with the materials and need to have a, an audit done on the usage of that material, how much, how much they have left. Uh, we're doing a lot more video, uh, uh, so observation and analysis through, for traffic patterns and volume analysis for traffic uh, engineers. And then the aerial imagery, as I showed you, just for things like uh, we're doing with oil and gas uh, and the video production. At the bottom there, the most important thing, as I kind of touched on here, is that data fusion and data mining and part of the software programs like PIX4D make it possible for us to do all this. And that's essentially where we're gonna be combining data from whether it's collected with a drone, mobile system, uh, or terrestrial scanner. And this is a, a, an example of a data set that goes right down and across a river crossing where we use bathymetry to get the surface data underneath the water that they needed as they were gonna put a little bridge across this area. Um, so again, Fusing this data or using hybrid data from all these geospatial data collection methods is becoming the norm in what we do, not the exception anymore. And the reason is, is because of the angle of incident. Uh, just real quickly here, to touch on an airborne system on the left versus a, a terrestrial system that we're looking at and that we analyze, you know, using software like Pix4D on so that we can see more of the hill, we'll use different applications for that as we move forward. And so I always like to point out to people that I'm talking with uh, that are working with, with drones that, hey, don't just stop working in the aerial component. There's a lot of data that needs to be captured from the ground, whether with a terrestrial scanner or with a mobile system. Um, as you know, if you're using a, an airplane versus a drone, you're going to have a larger footprint just because when you're flying a little bit higher, you can capture more stuff on the ground. So that's another key component of the things that we look at uh, as we're working with uh, UAS and other geospatial data collection methods. And lastly here, just to touch on some of what the data sets that we see that we, we use and why we use different things with drones uh, to collect data. So this is a profile of a heavy tree canopied area. The green data uh, was collected photogrammetrically with a drone or just using photographs. The white data uh, and the data along the, the bottom of the ground or the, the bare earth surface was LIDAR data that was actually able to penetrate through that canopy and get through there. Again, we use software applications like PIX4D to be able to do this and see this kind of stuff. And so that software can be rather useful for students moving forward, uh, learning how to understand that they use this uh, in the different applications. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll defer my questions to the end of things and turn things over to Roger here and stop sharing at this point. And, and uh, sorry to cover so much data so quickly. 
that was great. I knew it would be a good intro to where I was uh, wanted to go. Let me grab the share here real quick. Come on. Oh, I think it's because my screen's maximized. I don't see the bottom there to share. And uh, let's show this. Excellent. We'll put this off to the other side of the screen and let's jump in here. All right, do you guys see my my um, slides? Yes, sir. Awesome. Uh, my name is Roger Palmer. I taught high school uh, for 30 years, uh, 28 years, sorry. Uh, but the last 18 was in Bishop Dunn, South Dallas. Um, worked with students doing combinations. I was chemistry and physics, but uh, towards the end we added GIS and, uh, and a lot of research kinds of projects. Um, in that process, I worked in a company that my wife and I started to train teachers to use this. Um, back in 2000, well, 1999, actually, we started that. Um, and then just this last year after I retired, I'm working now for Pasco Scientific, who makes probes on a small scale that work in a wireless sort of environment. And we live in exciting times. Uh, we were uh, using technologies as early as GPS units that looked like these on the left for schools um, and equipment that measured things like dissolved oxygen or carbon dioxide or pH in a stream. And that as they get smaller, you can see as we move to the right, uh, we can add GPS to your watch or um, some of the probes I talked about in the sensing kind of community from air quality to water quality to soil quality. And started to combine those um, into images that just fit on a small phone. Um, and now we put them all together in a mobile platform in the air like this uh, uh, um, drone in the bottom right um, and the one that's handheld there is a lidar sort of picture that we were talking about before Bill um, but uh, what I think in terms of schools is, is of course affordability and, and how to get started um, and the concern to be legal um, so something like the Mavic Mini which is about 450 um, is probably a great starting platform because it has a downward look I love the Tello and we we were working with our middle school kids to, to learn to program those um, and they're great because they're $100, uh, but to do some sort of projects like we're going to talk about, uh, we need a little bit little bit more. And I love that the uh, Mambo was around and had a downward facing camera, but no, unfortunately they don't continue to manufacture those. And not just like you had mentioned um, that there's just DJI because there definitely are some some others. Parrot is France, um, Unique uh, I think is in the US. Um, Skydio's got an interesting one that actually figures out its full 3D surrounds and it will fly through obstacles and around obstacles. So that's kind of cool. Uh, but what we need in terms of school is, is we need to plan where we need to send the drone with flight planning software. We need to pull the images it takes into a single, uh, you know, sort of mosaic. Um, we need to look for the 3D data like you had talked about, uh, Bill, and that we have to do the, uh, tell the story when it's done. So um, this is the very first project I worked at in 1996. I think I rented a plane and took pictures out the window. And then my students walked along this creek to find all the deep spots and the, and the, the logs and where the fish would go. Um, and so what, we, what is cool is that in the 20 years since that's sort of happened is that if with two pieces of software, again, it's, it's really about keeping a minimal sort of amount of software um, that it can get done with ArcGIS Pro because it's affordable for schools um, and uh, it's about, I think, for desktop software, it's uh, for a school get 250, but you can even get free ArcGIS online, uh, which we want my students to learn because then they can, they can broadcast that out to any. And the desktop is free as well. Uh, my wife, who's the business partner with Esri, is telling me in the background. So Pix4D, of course, is a little more. Um, that's 2000 for a sort of school education license that doesn't do any work for, for money. So those are two ways that we kind of get started. I love the Pix4D creates sort of a 3D look. Um, it almost is as detailed as LiDAR. Um, and we can use those to get the elevation information that we can put GIS uh, data alongside with it. And so here's an example of just flowing through the school like you saw with um, the previous presentation. Um, it's nice is because it's, you know, can get to build these. I love the ability to do the fly throughs like you had done. Here's the Dallas Zoo um, in the elephant sort of uh, enclosure that they'd asked to say, hey, can we get you guys to come over and fly and build us a 3D model? Uh, we made it eventually out of paper so that you could cut it and make 3D models and talk about what was going on out of there for their teacher summer. Institute a couple of years back. 
um, which is nice, and you can program that. And I did that all in Pix4D. Um, but the students that came out there and helped us to plan where they needed to fly and have it go through uh, was a, a wonderful experience for them. Uh, the mosaic images alone were fantastic to print off the pictures. Like I said, we built them in, in 3D so that um, uh, you can see a little bit. There's hundreds of pictures just for that small couple acre, well, I think it's a, yeah, a couple acre sort of spot for the elephants. Just to give you an idea, that's a two, uh, three foot square sort of drainage ditch. They just cleaned the, the pond for the elephants so you could see it at the bottom. Um, and uh, the accuracy is down in the centimeter range uh, for most pictures that we use. Once the project's done, they uh, Pix4D leaves them into these three folders, like a digital surface model, a mosaic picture, um, and uh, um, other project data, but usually we just use those, those first two, the elevation and information uh, 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 grid and then the mosaic image. What can students do? Well, we took and flew our baseball field and we, we took some time that took a couple of weeks to then figure out what the elevation was, determine the slope, um, take the slope and, and take and say, hey, where does it, you know, every lower pixel would send its water down to the next lowest pixel. And so that we did a drainage model. Um, we took then an accumulation model to figure out where and how much total volume would go there. Um, and if you see about in the middle where the round, the women's softball field is, the, the water does drain right out to there. And any time it has a good rain, we could go out and double check to see if, if our understanding was correct. That was, uh, that was a little gymnastics. That was fantastic sort of support um, that our students could do. Um, and so that, uh, that was one of the projects that the students can, can work through. Uh, some friends at the university would take and fly their campus and build a base map, if you recognize. This uh, is over at uh, Brookhaven. I'm going to go ahead and just click on that real quick, and let's see if that'll bring me up to a web map. So once we've taken those, those images and, and made them available, we can put them in ArcGIS Online. And that's where the power of, of this is live now, I'm just using my web browser to go around. What this would be great for is if we want to a survey together and have students go and look at condition of infrastructure or maybe look for invasive species or you know how fire ants spread through something some region that's me interacting with it now as we're talking to you um, that was 600 or so pictures that uh, that the university students were able to put through and we've done the same for some of the learning centers like the Audubon centers in Dallas um, where we do a, a, an overview image and then uh, we'd build an app that would use that image because it's sitting in ArcGIS online so that on the phone you could literally go back and do collections of things that you would find there and get uh, like on the elephant example we built an app so that the the keepers could watch and say hey when we put enrichment uh, when do the elephants interact with that enrichment uh, but you have to have some sort of a platform to share that on as well. Um, so those are fantastic sort of examples. Here's a, an example. One of my students uh, got an internship with a graduate student that was at SMU who was a National Geographic fellow and so she ended up going down with her mom and, and I, I went down with the, the team and we were going into the Amazon here and we got a chance to, to look a little bit at the, the tree cover um, that is around a, a natural site there that has a geothermal river. Uh, we're going to get a feeling for the canopy as that uh, is put together and all that kind of data. You can measure the volumes of those trees. Um, as we saw before, we can get a feeling for what types of trees are there, even just with the different colors. Um, and the student kept doing that work. She's now at the University of uh, Boulder and studying GIS as, as part of her studies. And there's where we sent the drone from. Um, that's me in the red, couple pixels, and it's her in the couple blue pixels there. So uh, some, some fun kinds of oops, things. Let's continue there. So what can you do with these finished data? I think, um, you know, there's a lot that can go on. Anything from environmental platforms, learning the robotics, as you've seen, um, the panoramics to print off some service things for your community. Um, the zoo appreciated big maps that we were able to print. Um, creating great movie shots is what the student talked about in the previous um, presentation the hour before, if you watched that. Um, so all of those are, are just great ways to get students to do service, plus uh, find ways to, to have a class to, to learn these technologies. And so I really worked hard to find ways student could come along, somebody find out what they needed, um, and we could do a project uh, for them. And it was just called their senior research or a synthesis class, which um, 
I think Mark talked about in the very first session this morning is that sometimes that's the way that's held. But we do put this into our classes for chemistry and for geography. Um, so they learn a little GIS in the robotics classes. They're learning about the, the robotics. And I'm trying to pull along as many teachers as possible because when I find we get that number of teachers, we have a community that we can kind of learn from. I'll keep going other kinds of possible projects that I was trying to get one of my students to do is show the change in the tree growth from one year to the next. And uh, um, well, we got close. I did just never, that one never came through, but printing 3D surfaces and volumes. Um, if you see the picture on the bottom was the area where Canyon Lake had flooded after it rained 27 inches one week. And it really dug out that, that region in the bottom. Now, um, while we could learn from our, our own field how to get the elevation information to do that kind of analysis, we could go off to the state site and get some CAD data so that they could, they could follow the same sort of procedures to, to learn what kind of volume change was happening. So a um, lot of things going on um, that we can, we can look for. Weed detection, like I said, ant infestations after rain, the ants seem to boil out at the surface. So it's a lot of good uh, projects. Last one, a lot of teachers ask, how can we fund these? I think partnering with some agencies, like partner with your football team. Um, we saw that in the previous hour, if you were watching the students um, talk about it. Your geography department might love to get some um, the ability to have sort of a, a shot of some local area in your community that uh, deals with geographic concepts. Uh, get there with your photography teacher. Um, and so um, I found definitely things on sale at Craigslist or in, in garage sales for, for a quarter of the price, uh, you know, $100 drone that was, was thousands. And so all of those would be great ways to continue as you're saying, how can I get this going in my school? And as a class, I think you can, you can find that that's great. PTAs are, are awesome ideas. Um, I'm, I'm going to go quickly over those because those are fun. And if you get the, uh, um, if you get the, the PowerPoint, I'll send this over and you can, you can take a look at those. There's some inspirational sort of ways that people are using professionally. But really, these tools help students plan brighter tomorrows um, from, the, from the Amazon, which we saw one of my students able to get, um, that they can do things that weren't possible before and for four or $500 drone. Um, some of the tools that we talk about, they're learning skills they'll use for the rest of their lives and they can communicate and engage with people that are trying to get things done and it helps them to really, to make a difference. So um, I will also say most of my references here in terms of the programs are on this presentation, which we'll make available. And of course, I love the, the picture of Superman here saying, the, the answer used to always be me, but now all the people care about are drones. So with that, I will be finished. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I, I love that. And, and I have to say something that, you know, goes along with Superman, but you're all still Superman <laughs> in the classroom, but it's true. You light up a drone and you have students' attention like that, no matter what the age is. So that was something that, that sold me on it as well. Um, incredibly impressed by all of you, and, and I can't thank you enough for your time. Um, those of you that are listening in, there is going to be links to all the recordings. I believe Ken will be sending those out sometime next week. Um, and we will be on here for the chat for a few minutes if you have anything. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your weekend. And, and again, thank you all for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you. I think everybody was so incredibly thorough in their presentations, there just aren't any questions. Yeah. Everybody's left speechless. <laughs> and, and it's Saturday afternoon at four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great stuff, Roger. Really interesting. I, I do a lot of work with uh, the North Central Texas Aerial Robotics Advisory Committee, and that's Fort Worth ISD, and I think 10 other ISDs are involved with that, and they're trying to expand it. Uh, and uh, 
my interest is, is that, you know, we need not the drone pilots necessarily. I mean, we need that as well, but we need geospatial technicians. Right. Um, and, and, you know, there's jobs there and in land surveying as well, because this is where most of this stuff is landing. Um, and in many cases that you don't have to have a four year degree to become a you know, registered professional land surveyor. Um, so it, it's kind of open to, you know, kids that want to do that or don't want to do that. So well, glad to see what you're doing with the students. It's awesome. Yeah. Thankfully I've got the geography teacher who teaches GIS as well when he, when he takes the kids and so does our uh, learning special um, support person has classes that she does the computer science programming. So as, as many people as we could, everything from the football teacher coach to the, to the gym, you know, sort of specialist, if we can get them, you know, to keep doing those things, then we are all sort of thinking, you know, hey, we can use spatial technologies from a wristwatch that tells how fast the kids are running to, to using photos for, for a football game or to, to doing analysis like we're doing. So, yeah, yeah. I love that. I love how you brought so many different teachers in and especially the geography teacher. Gosh, that's brilliant. So logical, but I think that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm totally excited in terms of, you know, both, Marissa, what you were talking about in the programming side is to learn more because it's our our robotics was such a he had his master's in engineering and i'm just like i know we can do this with those drones um and so i i definitely i will send um some encouragement to him to continue using that um and see where we can go with it excellent and i see francisco yeah, sure. listening how are you old friend <laughs> great to see you <laughs> I'm here. Thank you very much. Excited and happy with everything we have learned today. Oh, I'm so glad you joined us. Now, where where are you teaching nowadays? I'm with Austin ISD. Oh, great. Great. So not too far. No, 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 no. Fantastic. Oh, I'm and so willing, happy to do that. Yeah, I'm willing to start a program here in Dripping Springs, but uh, I'll contact you later. I'm not sure. I believe I have your email address. Yes, yes, perfect. It should be on here as well. So great. Look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, thank you. It's a little bit after four, so I think we're safe to, to say goodbye. Um, all of you enjoy. Thanks for sharing your brilliance and your expertise, and i um, very grateful for, for your time. You all have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.